Most athletes spend a great deal of time and attention on what they eat and drink. However, most athletes pay practically no attention to how they breathe. We all intuitively understand the importance of breathing good quality air. But what about the quantity? How much air should we breathe and how should we breathe for optimal performance? These are questions that Patrick McCone answers in his book The Oxygen Advantage, and it's what I'll be summarizing in this video. There are five important ideas that you should take away from this video. The first is that you should get in the habit of breathing through your nose. In his book, Patrick explains the benefits of nasal breathing and the negative effects of mouth breathing. To name a few, nasal breathing leads to deep diaphragmatic breathing, which stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system and makes us feel relaxed. Whereas mouth breathing leads to shallow breathing, which stimulates our sympathetic nervous system and makes us feel stressed. Shallow mouth breathing also constricts our airways and blood vessels, which makes it harder for us to breathe and decreases the delivery of oxygen to our muscles, tissues, heart, and brain. Deep nasal breathing has the opposite effect. It opens our airways and dilates our blood vessels, which allows for better oxygen delivery. Nasal breathing also increases our levels of nitric oxide, a gas that we naturally create in our nasal cavity. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator, meaning that it relaxes our inner muscles of our blood vessels, causing the blood vessels to widen. In this way, nitric oxide increases blood flow and delivery of oxygen to our muscles and tissues. A natural way we can increase our levels of nitric oxide is by humming. One study found that humming increased nitric oxide up to 15 fold in comparison with quiet exhalation. Another reason to breathe through our nose is to avoid over breathing. And this brings us to the second important takeaway, which is, when it comes to breathing, less is more. The amount of oxygen our muscles and tissues are able to use is not solely dependent on the amount of oxygen in our blood. Our red blood cells are normally saturated with between 95 to 99% oxygen, more than enough that our body needs for intense exercise. So, since our blood is already full of oxygen, taking in more oxygen with bigger breaths does not increase the amount of oxygen our muscles are able to use. Instead, what is important is getting that oxygen out of our red blood cells so that it can be used by our muscles and tissues. And carbon dioxide is what allows for the release of oxygen from our red blood cells. If we take large breaths through our mouth, we lose a large amount of this precious carbon dioxide, which results in less oxygen reaching our muscles and tissues. This physiological phenomenon is called the Bohr effect. Essentially, Oxygen is carried by a protein inside red blood cells called hemoglobin, and the Bohr effect tells us that an increase in carbon dioxide increases our blood's pH levels, and hemoglobin releases its load of oxygen, so that it can be used by our muscles and tissues. A decrease in carbon dioxide has the opposite effect. It increases our blood's pH levels and causes hemoglobin to hold on to its load of oxygen. Another problem with overbreathing is that it can result in an increased sensitivity and lower tolerance to carbon dioxide. As Patrick explains, the rate and volume of breathing is determined by receptors in the brain that monitor the concentration of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the blood, along with the pH level. When levels of carbon dioxide increase above a certain amount, the receptors in our brain stimulate breathing in order to eliminate the excess carbon dioxide. Essentially, the primary stimulus to breathe is to eliminate excess carbon dioxide from our body. When we overbreathe, we eliminate too much carbon dioxide. And if we keep this up over an extended period of time, our body adapts to become more sensitive to carbon dioxide. Think of it like this. Let's say this is a measurement of the amount of CO2 in our body. And this is the amount of CO2 at which the receptors in our brain stimulate breathing. When we overbreathe, we decrease the amount of carbon dioxide in our body. If we keep this up over an extended period of time, we will condition our body to this new set point at which less carbon dioxide will stimulate breathing. This can lead to a vicious cycle in which our increasingly sensitive carbon dioxide receptors lead us to breathe more. 
and breathing more means we expel more carbon dioxide, which makes the protein hemoglobin in red blood cells hold on to oxygen instead of releasing it to our muscles. Our muscles then do not perform as effectively as they should, which makes us feel breathless and breathe even more. The result is chronic overbreathing, suboptimal endurance, and a higher risk of injury. So what can we do to avoid this from happening? This brings us to key takeaway number three. If we want to avoid overbreathing and eliminating excessive amounts of precious carbon dioxide, we should get in the habit of breathing slowly and quietly through our nose. This is a common practice in the Chinese philosophy of Taoism, which describe ideal breathing as so smooth that the fine hairs within the nostrils remain motionless. Breathing fast and through the mouth for short periods of time is not a problem, as no permanent change in the body occurs. For example, during maximum exertion in exercise, we naturally begin to breathe heavier and through our mouth. Also, the Wim Hof method breathing exercises include a series of fast hyperventilating breaths. This is okay. Overbreathing and breathing with your mouth is not a problem in small doses. It becomes a problem if that is our normal state of breathing. The fourth key takeaway is to strengthen your diaphragm. The diaphragm is the main muscle for breathing. As we breathe hard during exercise, our diaphragms are prone to fatigue. When the diaphragm fatigues, it requires more oxygen, which means that less oxygen will be available for other working muscles. Through breath hold exercises, we can strengthen our diaphragm to delay diaphragm fatigue and improve our endurance. More on this in a future video. The last takeaway is to strive for a BOLT score of 40 seconds. BOLT stands for Blood Oxygen Level Test, and it is a measure of our breathlessness and how much carbon dioxide we can tolerate. The test is simple. Take a normal breath in, a normal breath out, then stop breathing and hold your nostrils shut with your fingers. Time the number of seconds until you feel the first definite desire to breathe. This could be sensations like the need to swallow or a contraction of your abdomen. When you feel something like this, stop the timer. Your inhalation at the end of the breath hold should be calm. Bolt is not a measure of our willpower or determination, so the goal is not to try to hold our breath for as long as possible. Instead, it is about holding our breath until we feel that first definite desire to breathe. A Bolt score of 20 seconds is average and a score of 40 is quite good. In a future video, I'll be showing you strategies to improve your Bolt score and strengthen your diaphragm. Subscribe to the channel to be notified when that video comes out and to receive the best strategies for elite performance. In the meantime, I highly recommend you check out Patrick's book and YouTube channel for a more thorough understanding of this topic.